Isn't it interesting how you speak to different people in your life in different ways? I mean, you don't speak to your best friend in the same manner that you speak to your grandmother or your team's coach. Why is that? Is it a different facet of our personalities coming to the surface? Do we have different personalities all wrapped up into one overarching personality that we call our own? You see, living abroad is like that. You adapt your personality and manners of speech to fit the situation or the people that you're speaking with in any given moment. After over a decade of global travel, as well as years spent living abroad, I've come to the realization that there is no right way to do anything. Each place and culture does things differently. And for the people who are living there, that's the right way to do it. So in this video, I'm gonna be giving a comparison of three different countries that I've lived in in my life the United States where I was born and raised and have lived most of my life, as well as New Zealand where my dad is from, where I am currently living with my wife and have been living for the last two and a half years, and Spain where I taught English abroad and lived for three years after university. I want to share some observations, some of the things that I've come to learn after living in these various countries, about the way that people live in each of them, how it's different from one another, and how it influences people's perspectives and lifestyles. I should clarify though, before moving forward, that these are just my opinions and that they're also generalizations. So let's have fun with this, okay? Before we get started though, take a second and hit that subscribe button if you're not already subscribed. Give this video a thumbs up if you enjoy it and turn on notifications so you don't miss out on any future videos. Also, tell me in the comment section if you've ever lived abroad, if so, where did you live, how long, and how did it influence your life? And if you haven't lived abroad yet, where would you like to live abroad and why? Tell me down there in the comment section, don't be shy. I love reading your comments, your opinions, and creating and building this community together. Living in a foreign culture is this beautiful, delicate balancing act of doing things the way that you know, the way that you were taught growing up in the culture that you live in, and on the other hand, adapting to and integrating into your host culture. Firstly, let's talk about time. While across every culture here on planet Earth, time is still measured in the same way, well, that's actually not really true. Believe it or not, time is subjective and it's interpreted in different ways across different cultures. While most cultures on planet Earth measure time with 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, and 24 hours in a day, certain cultures don't do that at all. There's cultures in the Amazon, uncontacted tribes, etc., where they actually don't measure time like that at all. It's actually measured by place, um, but that's a whole different conversation and one for a different video. In the United States, if someone is late, it's considered rude. It's almost like an insult. People don't value your time and therefore they don't value you as an individual, especially if it's a business meeting. If you're late to a social gathering, you can be considered fashionably late, although uh, it's, it's a little bit of a no-no. You're probably gonna get some flack from your friends, mostly in a playful way, but if it's something that's consistently done, if you're consistently late, your friends might hold it against you. And if you're late to a date, well, chances are there might not be a second one. Here in New Zealand, people are a little bit less fussed about time. New Zealanders, known as Kiwis, are generally much more laid back than their counterparts in the USA. And then on the far end of the spectrum, you have Spain, where people are late all the time and it's just culturally accepted. There's a grace period of around five to 30 minutes in which it's generally socially acceptable to be late. And if someone apologizes for being late, generally people will respond with no pasa nada or it's all good, it doesn't mean anything, no worries. If you're 30 minutes late in the United States, especially if it's a business meeting, things probably won't go very well. And maybe that has something to do with where people tend to focus. In the USA, we're constantly dreaming up the next big thing living in the future and thinking about what's to come. With this in mind, the phrase time is money holds weight in the United States. On the flip side though, this obsession with time takes its toll on individuals, leaving us more stressed out, anxious, 
and prone to burnout and exhaustion. Whereas in Spain and in Latin countries in general, people tend to live more in the moment. They're less worried about what's coming around the corner or in the future, which allows them to be more fully present. It also allows them to be late. There's a Spanish phrase that sums this up perfectly. No hay prisa. It means there's no rush. And another one which goes like this. A beber y tragar, porque mañana el mundo se va a acabar. Which means eat up, drink up, because we'll probably be dead tomorrow. It's a reminder that life is short and should be fully appreciated and lived right now. One of the biggest differences in approaches to time is actually around eating. In the USA, we tend to eat on the move. In fact, it was America that invented fast food, the TV dinner, delivery food, and a whole host of other convenient yet kind of problematic eating habits. When you eat out in the USA, it's not at all uncommon for your server to come up while you're still eating and leave the check on the table. Sometimes they even clear plates while you're still eating off of them. These practices rush us and remind us that there's other people waiting to sit down and to eat, and it's kind of a polite even though I don't really think it's all that polite, way to say, hurry up, finish up, and get out of here. Now, I don't know exactly why this is done, but I think it probably has something to do with the fact that servers in the USA are often paid minimum wage and live off of tips. So the more customers they get, the more tips they get, the more money they make. So they're kind of incentivized to serve you and to get you out of there as quickly as possible. In Spain, practices like this are considered extremely rude. Eating in Spain is this communal, family and friend-centric event where people are happy to take and spend a lot of time. In Spain and in Europe in general, they practice the opposite of fast food, slow food, best summed up in the slow food movement, which aims to protect traditional foods and food cultures from the impatient, incessant approach of modern fast food culture. In Spain, it's not at all unusual for people to sit after eating a meal for hours, casually sipping a glass of wine in what's called the sobremesa, the casual conversation that's had after a meal is finished. Personally, I loved Spain's approach to food and to eating, even if it took me a little bit of time to get used to the new schedule, especially eating dinner so late sometimes even as late as 11 p.m. It's usually only in the summer though, when the sun doesn't go down until 10.30 p.m. Spaniards typically eat their first meal of the day at around 7 a.m. It's probably just an espresso or a small coffee, cafe cortado, with a croissant or another small baked good. Then they have another light meal around 10 or 11 a.m. Then a big lunch called comida, anywhere from noon until 3 p.m. That's also usually had with a glass or a small bottle of wine and followed by a coffee. And if you live in the south of Spain, it's usually followed by a siesta or a nap. It can be followed by a merienda or an afternoon snack, maybe some tapas after that. And then you have dinner anywhere from 9 to 11 p.m. Dinner's usually lighter though, it's not a very heavy meal. The heaviest meal of the day is that comida. It's a very interesting approach to eating and one I really actually enjoyed while living in Spain. Here in New Zealand, people's approach to time is much more laid back than in the United States. Oftentimes, you can go over to a friend's house for a cup of tea, and end up spending hours there, maybe even going for dinner. Although you do have to kind of clarify because going for a cuppa usually is just a cup of tea, but coming over for tea is actually more like a meal. But in general, people are pretty laid back and happy to spend time with each other. Living in these divergent cultures has helped me appreciate living in the present moment more, while the American in me allows me to do so without sacrificing, planning, and executing in the present to have a better future. Because what we do today affects our tomorrow. One of the other big differences is in attitudes. In Spain, they have a phrase, a ver, which means, we'll see. That's how people tend to respond when you share an idea or something that you're passionate about or something that you'd like to do. We'll see, a ver. It's not malicious and it's not negative. It's more just generally ambivalent but they'll wish you the best of luck. In New Zealand, there's a thing called tall poppy syndrome. Imagine a field full of poppies, flowers, 
climbing to the sun. One poppy starts getting a little bit bigger than the rest of them. But what does New Zealand do? Celebrate its unique growth capacity? Shower it in praise and encourage it to keep growing? Unfortunately, no. They cut it down to size to make sure that the other poppies don't feel self-conscious about their inability to keep up with that one fast-growing poppy. This is what's called tall poppy syndrome. It's one of the reasons why my father left New Zealand in the 1980s and moved to the United States. And having lived here for a few years, while I'd like to think that it's no longer around, I do still think that it is present here in the culture in New Zealand. In the United States, things are different. Culturally, the United States highlights those who outperform and achieve the impossible. In the US, we love that underdog story of the person who had all the odds stacked against them, but through sheer perseverance, overcame those odds and achieved their dream, whether that's building a business or winning a championship, whatever it is, we love that story. And that's honestly one of the things I love the most about the United States. It's a country that champions the best performers, rewards the entrepreneurs and the creatives who come up with new and novel ideas that fix problems with different approaches. And after applauding them, asks with genuine interest how they did it. That is a beautiful thing. And I genuinely wish that that mentality was more present around the world. Okay, so next up, one of the biggest differences between these three countries is health, and in particular, health care. In both Spain and New Zealand, there is public health care. It's taken care of by the government, and while some people might say, oh, you know, the public health care system is bad, it doesn't work quickly, at least it's there. It's actually really nice to just be able to go to a doctor when you need to without having to pay for private healthcare. In the US, there's a private healthcare system. It's expensive to get good healthcare, and unfortunately, many people living in the USA cannot afford healthcare at all. That's, I think, one of the biggest challenges of living in the United States, and something that people may take for granted if they have access to public health care. I think that public health care is, is great and it's a, it's a really wonderful thing to just be able to go to a doctor when you need it without having to pay uh, expensive monthly premiums for health care. Even just navigating the healthcare system in the United States, trying to figure out which plan to have with what premium, uh, it was a nightmare. Uh, and uh, I don't miss that at all. Healthcare and access to healthcare between these three countries is really different. And I don't know where you're watching from, but what is the healthcare system in your country? Please share down there in the comment section. I wanna preface this next bit by saying everybody's bodies are different. There is no one factor in which we can say somebody's healthy or unhealthy, and I, totally understand because I have struggled with my health, my weight, and my uh, self-confidence about that throughout my entire life. In regards to people's health, in Spain, most people are fairly fit and active. Just go to a beach in the summertime in Spain and you'll see most people are thin, uh, most people are half naked or even fully naked and they're definitely tan. In the USA, it kind of feels like the opposite is true. I'm not sure exactly what it is about living in the United States, but for me, it's always been challenging to keep excess weight off. And I'm not alone in that. A recent study by Healthline showed that 42% of American adults are now obese and 30% are overweight, which means over two thirds of American adults are either obese or overweight, making the USA the number one most obese country in the OECD, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And New Zealand is not faring too much better in that regard either. In fact, it's now the third most obese country in the OECD, with one in three adults classified as obese. It's hard to say exactly what's causing this. I think it's a combination of factors, but there's a lot of new research coming out that is really interesting and unsettling. One of the main differences between Spain and Europe in general, and the United States in particular, are different 
agricultural and industrial practices around food, especially in regards to processing food and additives. A lot of the additives, uh, as well as petrochemical fertilizers, herbicides, pesticides that are used in the United States are illegal in Europe and in the EU due to the fact that many scientific studies are showing that a lot of these uh, substances actually are harmful to human health and many of which have been proven to be cancer causing. These are causing a myriad of health problems as well as additives like canola oil and obviously added sugar. These processed foods, oftentimes made with genetically modified or engineered crops, are available um, widely at a low price, but these are super bad foods for us. And it's crazy. I think one of the biggest crimes in the modern world is the fact that clean, whole, organic foods are much more expensive to produce than these cheap, processed, genetically modified uh, crops, which are, you know, covered in toxic chemicals. And it's really sad. So it's one of the reasons I believe it's really important, if you can, to learn how to grow some of your own food, grow a backyard garden, grow some stuff on an apartment balcony or inside your apartment. There's a lot of different options. There's a lot of ways that you can take a little bit more ownership and take back some of that power in growing your own food. So yeah, like I said, in Spain, a lot of food from America is not allowed into the country. For example, Skittles, Pop-Tarts, Gatorades, as well as all those products from Little Debbie like Twinkies and stuff like that. Those are banned from Spain and from the EU because they have additives like Yellow 5, Yellow 6, Red 40. These have been proven uh, in studies to be harmful to human health, especially for children. Another one of the things that's different though is that people just generally value home cooked food. And I think they have a direct connection to their heritage in a sense that people, oftentimes la abuela, your grandmother will live with you in a multi-generational household and you can learn recipes and traditions from your grandmother or your grandfather and take those and pass those along. So you're, you're learning food that has been a part of your family and a part of your heritage and you're taking that and you're eating that and you're absorbing that and you're passing it on to the future. We're really disconnected in the United States from our heritage and from where we come from. So we don't have that connection through food. And I think that that's one of the things in Spain that is that I noticed to be so, so different and so powerful was this connection to food, connection to recipes, connection to place. And I think that, that just makes life so much more enriching and also just completely reevaluates and changes your connection to food. Also, people in Spain walk a lot, especially in city centers. You don't even really need a car. You can get around through public transportation, buses, bikes, trains, and then walking. In Spain, in the evening, people, families will go out and they'll just walk around. You'll go down to the, you know, um, to the promenade and, and walk. Go for a stroll, sit in a plaza, have conversations, have connection, talk to your neighbors. I think all of those things kind of come together to, to make it a, um, a, a more healthy experience. But I should clarify that not everything in, in Spain is healthy. People smoke a lot, uh, all different ages. Young people, they buy cigarettes and uh, they buy rolling tobacco. They roll their own cigarettes. Middle-aged people will buy a pack of cigarettes, which you can actually buy from vending machines there. And then older people will smoke cigars or pipes and they all smoke a lot. It's very socially accepted. And yet, people seem to live a long time, older. They drink often, they have a glass of wine or a couple glasses of wine a day. They smoke and they seem to be living into their you know, 80s and 90s. So I don't know what it is, but they are kind of bucking a trend there. 
Another thing that's different between all of these countries is their approach to alcohol. In the US, maybe it's because of our Puritan past and the prohibition that the country did in the 1920s and 30s uh, that we have a very restrictive culture around alcohol. You can't drink alcohol in the USA until you're 21 years old, although you can vote at 18, you can drive a car at 16, and you can go to war at 18. You can't have a beer or a glass of wine until you're 21. And I think that that restrictive culture around alcohol actually uh, has the opposite effect. It makes people want it more and uh, it leads to all sorts of oftentimes tragic events with alcohol poisoning, drunk driving, um, and yeah, just like generally hiding alcohol, not having a good relationship with it, binge drinking, because it's not eased into a person's life. Whereas here in New Zealand, you as a minor can go into a restaurant with your parents or your legal guardian, and your parents or legal guardian can buy you a beer or a glass of wine or a drink, and you can have it in the bar, or you can have it in that restaurant under supervision, and that's totally legal. In Spain, the drinking age is 18, but culturally, it's much more accepted. People drink oftentimes in public with what's called botellón, where you meet up with your friends and you have some drinks in public, usually in a central plaza before going to bars and partying all night. That's a thing in Spain. I can tell you I had a few nights while living in Spain where, uh, yeah, I stayed out all night and we would end with a, a churro y chocolate, a churro and a hot chocolate, like a dipping hot chocolate. You'd have that at like seven in the morning when the cafes would open and it would be, you know, the morning birds having, <laughs> a cup of coffee and then all the leftover people from the night before. Uh, I couldn't really hang with that. I, pulling an all-nighter is definitely something that was possible in my early 20s and does not sound even remotely appealing now in my mid-30s. But I, I think that that approach to alcohol, you know, I think you have a lot less problems when it's something that is culturally accepted and is eased into a young person's life instead of restricting it prohibiting it and then having you know kids try to find ways to get it it just causes more problems in my opinion it causes more harm than um, just having a structured responsible way so yeah those are some of the main differences for sure and then I think you know the work-life balance is different in all of these countries it's on a spectrum where maybe New Zealand's somewhere in the middle Spain is on one side and uh, the U.S. is on the other. The U.S. is probably the most work-centric, career-orientated, money-focused, whereas New Zealand is, people are a little bit less interested in what you do and maybe more interested in what you do outside of work. That's probably what defines you more. People are really laid back here, you know. Go into the town that we live near on Friday at 5 p.m all the stores are shut because people stop working at five and they have a weekend. When we first moved here, it was kind of like, what? How this whole, it's a ghost town. But then we realized, oh, it's because it's Friday at five and you know, who really wants to be working Friday night? Probably not many people. So I think it's a beautiful thing actually that, um, th that there's that balance. And in the US, you know, people are expected to work every day, deep into the night, night shifts and et cetera, et cetera. And I think that that's probably one of the reasons why people feel burnt out and uninspired sometimes in the USA, because we overwork ourselves. And then on the far end of the spectrum, you have Spain, where the approach to work is really laid back. Like I said, they, they just wanna vivir la vida. And I think, you know, what you do is a lot less important in Spain than it is in the USA. Another interesting thing that I have noticed, you know, in the USA, you can walk into a bank and you can open a bank account right away. You can meet a person, meet a teller or an associate at the bank, sit down, open a bank right then and there. In Spain, 
Uh, it's pretty straightforward and easy as well. It is in Spanish, so if Spanish is not your first language, it could be a little bit fun trying to figure that out. Here in New Zealand, I was actually pretty floored when, when it was time to open a bank account, we were told that we had to make an appointment and uh, to, to meet with a teller, and the next appointment was one to two weeks away. I found that really interesting, like actually quite hard to believe that it could take so long just to open a bank account. I think that goes back to that approach of time, it goes back to that approach of you know, what's important, and I think that people are just a little bit less rushed here. Okay friends, well those are some of my uh, observations having lived in these three different countries. I know life is different everywhere. People do things differently everywhere and that's what makes life so beautiful. You know, Mark Twain once said that the world is a book and those who do not travel only read one page. That's a beautiful quote, but I'm gonna take it one step further and say, those who do not live abroad only read one chapter. I think living abroad is really enriching experience, but it's by no means easy. There's plenty of times where you say, wow, this is difficult. I'm gonna have to sit down and figure something out. There's a lot of obstacles and hurdles along the way. Sometimes things that should be simple are complicated. Sometimes things that are complicated are really simple. It's just the way that living abroad works and experiencing different cultures works. And I think it's a really beautiful, enriching experience. So is it worth it? Absolutely. Whether it's a study abroad program, a high school exchange, whether you move for a few months, a few years, or a few decades, I definitely highly recommend living abroad at least once in your life. It will give you new perspectives, challenge old preconceptions, expand your horizons both culturally and culinarily, create lifelong friendships, and teach you so much about yourself in ways that you just never could do living back home. Living abroad makes the world a smaller, less frightening place. It humanizes the other and highlights our shared humanity. It can be a hilarious experience and at times a harrowing one, but it's certainly one you will never forget and never regret. So tell me, have you ever lived abroad? If so, where and for how long? Put it down in the comment section. If you haven't lived abroad yet, what's holding you back? If you could, where would you move and why? Share your thoughts down there in the comment section. I really love reading your opinions and your perspectives and I love seeing you interact with each other. Let's continue to build this beautiful community. Okay friends, if you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you're not already subscribed. Turn on notifications if you don't have them on so you don't miss out on any future content. And if you're already a subscriber, please consider joining this channel, becoming a member for more behind the scenes content. And yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you in the next video. Later.